So I'm going to be talking about the Asian gypsy moth today and coming up with uh, a tool that we've developed to help reduce the number of inspections for um, this pest potentially coming into Australia. So for those that um, aren't familiar with the Asian gypsy moth, um, it is uh, a biosecurity risk to Australia. It can feed on over 600 different species of trees um, and there are 26 Australian native species um, in and amongst that. Um, so it is a big threat to the forestry and horticultural industries. Um, its main vector of movement is through ships coming into Australia from at-risk ports. Um, and the at-risk ports are from Far East Russia, Korea, Japan, China. They're the, um, the, the main areas of concern. Now, the biology of it is complicated, and there's a number of um, publications by David Gray outlining the biology, which is temperature regulated. Um, and the inspections for this pest are very timely and costly. Um, costly not only to, um, uh, I guess, the department, but also to the uh, ship captains. So the key questions for this particular project were around, you know, can we optimise the number of inspections that are happening at these ports? Um, and if so, what are the economic savings um, to Australia and also to the captains of these vessels? Um, can we also come up with some kind of risk profiling tool that can help inspectors target um, ships for inspection? Because currently they do, I think, about 150 ships um, per year they inspect. Uh, and can the tool be incorporated into their maritime arrival reporting system, the MARS tool, um, that is currently used to um, target ships for inspection for a, for a wide range of pests? So this is a very simple, um, simple diagram um, of the biology uh, showing the life cycle of the Asian gypsy moth. It looks fairly simple, but in and amongst, I guess, this diagram are um, different uh, temperatures. So, so this moth has to go, th the eggs that are laid from this moth have to go through um, three phases of diapause, which are temperature regulated. Um, so they lay their eggs in midsummer. Um, and then depending on, and, and these are experiments that were done by David Gray, um, they have to go through these three phases of diapause before they have any chance of, of hatching. So generally they'll go through a cool period before right at the end going through a warmer period when, when they hatch. So when you think about a ship coming from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere of the ships, moving very quickly to an Australian port, you can sort of think that that's very unlikely for a ship who might be carrying, um, which might be carrying eggs, that those eggs would, um, would hatch. Um, so this, this next slide is, um, I guess, showcasing why a risk profiling tool might be a good thing to do. So currently there are many ships targeted by um, an AGM questionnaire get, that gets um, sent out to vessels that have come from an at-risk port. So there are three AGM questions that get asked and the first one is around, you know, have you actually visited one of these at-risk ports? And if they answer yes to that, they get given a specific questionnaire to fill out. Um, so there are costs to inspect and there are also large delay and, and holding costs to the vessel. Um, and so this is, we've got an example here from the port of Newcastle, um, which shows that of, of nearly, you know, 1,100 vessels inspected for AGM, you know, this is, and this has come from DOOR itself, um, these are the inspection fees, so pretty high inspection fees, and a delay cost of around $40,000 per vessel per day. So in general, um, the inspection costs are roughly $800 per vessel for targeted AGM inspections, and for a full AGM inspection, it's $25,000 per vessel, so it's quite timely and costly. Um, and this just gives you a few statistics on from 2013 to 2015, how many vessels they inspected for AGM. So this slide is an attempt to summarise the types of modelling that we've done. Um, uh, so I'll take you through it, so it's a bit of a journey. Uh, so the idea is to come up with a risk profiling tool and for that to happen we need to know about ships and where they've come from and, and their first port of call into Australia. And so for that we used very expensive Lloyd's shipping data to do that. 
Um, our first attempt was using some data that we'd acquired through CSIRO, so 2010 Lloyd's data, and then we moved to some data that the department had from 2008 to 2016, but they were only able to um, process uh, 2014 to 2015 data. So what we did with that data is to work out um, from an at-risk port, from ships that travelled from an at-risk port, the shortest maritime path that they travelled to get to um, the first Australian port. And when we worked out that shortest maritime path, we extracted temperature along that pathway because temperature is what's governing that grey biological model. Um, we used, now in the Gray's papers, they talk about air temperature. Um, we can't get hold of air temperature across the ocean, it doesn't exist. Um, so we used as a proxy sea surface temperature from a NOAA product. Um, and so we extracted this temperature along the shortest maritime path and we introduced some uncertainty in the temperature that we extracted. So we randomised it um, a bit. And the way we came up with the randomisation is to basically extract the temperature along that shortest path and look at randomisations between plus or minus three degrees, which would take into account the fact that we're using sea surface temperature as a proxy. We may not have quite got the right path that that ship had taken. Um, and uh, we also tried to factor in climate change if we were going to use this in the future. So there were a bunch of publications that helped us with, with that decision. Um, and some of these publications, this one in particular, uh, said that there was a strong correlation between sea surface temperature and also air temperature. So we've got all these randomisations of temperature. We've got these temperature pathways from all these vessels from the 14-15 data. What we did is we ran it through the grey biological model to get out a simulated response. So I just want to say that this is a simulated response because we don't have any actual data. And the, the simulated response was three categories. It didn't hatch at all. It um, hatched en route within five days of reaching an Australian port or it hatched at an Australian port. So that was our three categories. Um, and as well as this, we also generated a bunch of explanatory variables. So we generated those two other AGM questions that were being used um, to try to identify which ships to inspect to see if they were actually important. And we also generated uh, a number of other variables which were temperature variables, things like along that pathway, how many days was a ship exposed to temperatures between five to 10 degrees, 10 to 15 and, and so forth. And then what we did is we created a statistical model. It's actually, um, it can be thought of as a machine learning model. Uh, it's a classification and regression tree with bootstrapping and cross-validation in there to bring in uncertainty and give us a, a probability of being in one of those three categories. So uh, this is what the model looks like. And I guess what I wanted you to focus on, rather than the actual detail, is it, the tree is fairly complex. The idea of the tree is that you, take, you answer a bunch of questions down a particular pathway until you reach an end node, which gives you a probability of being in one of those three groups. What I will highlight is that this first split over here, where you can see it's a very strong chance of, of um, not being a problem ship if you end up in this node, so uh, the chance of it um, hatching is, uh, is, is virtually none. Um, a large proportion of these simulated pathways actually fell into that node. So a very small proportion then had to go through these other pathways to get to a probability of, of being in, in one of those three groups. Um, the way I trained this tree is to make sure that I wasn't misclassifying any of the, the high-risk cases, so the, the ones where they hatched in Australia or hatched within five days as a, as a no-hatch. Um, and because the, the simulations produce so many no hatches, uh, it was um, quite a task to actually deliver a tree or deliver a model that we could use to predict, you know, whether or not a ship was going to be a problem ship um, because we had such a rare event. So we held an elicitation workshop last Monday with uh, door policy and risk and preparedness um, people to 
uh, talk about the methodology and talk about that tree in the previous slide. You'll probably notice that it doesn't actually have labels assigned with it. We just left it with the probabilities um, to work out if a ship was to end up in any one of these nodes, what would you do? Would you um, target the ship for inspection or would you, um, would you not? Uh, and so the way we did this was to um, start with the low risk nodes, the ones where it was pretty clear um, from the model that were unlikely to get uh, eggs on the ship um, and look through those and get out sample pathways and look at the temperature profile. Um, and then with the experts in the room determine whether or not we'd inspect that ship or not. Um, so we ended up, instead of with three categories in those terminal nodes, um, basically working out whether we'd inspect or not inspect. And we came up with this, I guess, diagram, um, which what we wanted to elicit from them is what sort of um, threshold would be acceptable for them. So if you add up those group two and group three, so, so um, if you add up those two last groups where you look at the probability of hatching within five uh, days from Australia or, in, or at an Australian port, uh, at what threshold would you be comfortable in sort of saying, well, we don't need to inspect this ship? So I'll come back to that in a moment. This is the tree we ended up um, uh, coming up with. So same tree as before, but now we've got nodes labelled as either red, which means we're going to inspect at each of those nodes, and some of these nodes are blue. So in some instances, it's, it was pretty clear cut to begin with, with the probabilities coming out of the model. Um, but in other instances, you know, it wasn't clear cut whether it's a class one, class two, or even a class three, but there were temperature profiles and shipping pathways that came up that they weren't too sure about. Um, in addition to developing this, this method, um, we also came up with a tool um, that can be used uh, like this with a graphical user interface or it can be actually implemented as a set of rules within the maritime arrival reporting system. But this is essentially what it looks like. Um, so the idea is you have a new ship, you have a set of ports that it's been to from an at-risk port with dates and times of departures and arrivals. Uh, you read it in, it comes up with their pathways and temperature profiles, um, which you can visually look at uh, to get a feeling of, of where they've been. And then it runs through the tool and it would give you a, a predicted probability of being in one of those three classes and a final classification. So this would need to be updated based on the elicitation workshop that we had. Um, so Paul Mabwazi, who's the actual project leader on this project, uh, did a cost-benefit analysis based on what the tool was um, producing. Um, it, it, thanks. Um, and the tool is based on, for the first three years, it's not producing any benefits. Um, in fact, there is a cost, which is in building and implementing the tool. But then from year four onwards, um, you've got benefits flowing in from the reduced number of inspections. Um, and based on the elicitation workshop, and I'll, I'll um, reiterate in the next slide, um, the people at the, the experts at the workshop came up with a threshold of about 10%, um, which equates to less than 1% of ships that need to be inspected. So when you're thinking about 1,200 ships being inspected, in a particular year, you're bringing it down to about 12 or maybe fewer ships when originally they were inspecting about 150 of them. So there is a really big saving um, um, that could come out of this tool. Um, so what he worked out is um, uh, he came up with a benefit cost ratio of 15 to one based on what this um, tool was suggesting, which basically says for every dollar invested, there's, 15, there's a $15 return to the Australian public. So as I mentioned, the elicitation workshop, we ended up coming up with a threshold of 10% based on that particular model. So um, any ships that fell into a node where class two and three combined um, was greater than 10% would, would be look, um, investigated or would be targeted for inspection. Um, and that could be less than 12 ships a year, which was really promising. 
Um, one of the caveats of this model is that it is just based on one year of data. It is a fairly rare event that we're identifying and it would be useful to have multiple years of data to um, d refine the model and just get some validation in there. Um, so we did talk to them at the workshop about potentially getting some extra funding just to finish that part of it. Um, and for, uh, to revisit the model and, and the threshold. So I'll leave it there with acknowledgements to all these different people from the department who helped out in the elicitation workshop and the extraction of the Lloyds data. Thank you.